Hello and welcome to today's segment on PFAS identification. This will be part one of a three-part series about the analytical chemistry of PFAS. So the first thing to talk about are the different analytical techniques that we use for PFAS. For polar and charged PFAS, so this is our, our P-phosphorus again. If you have not seen P-phosphorus, it is in um, a few other uh, episodes about uh, PFAS and their structures. Um, but the P-phosphorus here is actually PFOS. And this type of uh, PFAS we would analyze with usually an electrospray, LC, electrospray, LC, MS, MS. Um, so that's because these accept a charge readily in solution, and because they're water soluble, they can be done with liquid chromatography, that's LCMS. Um, but other uh, PFAS are a little more volatile, so they might do better on GCMS, so that's gas chromatography mass spectrometry. Whereas polar, uh, these polymer PFAS, polymeric PFAS, um, it's difficult to say. It's a very diverse class. Um, these are big. They're, they're difficult to measure and to quantify or even to get into solution for some of these techniques. Um, so that's just a basic, basic overview on the um, analytical chemistry here. But what you'll see in common, whether they're volatile or water soluble, is this mass spectrometry. So what is mass spectrometry in the context of PFAS? In any case, PFAS mass spectrometry is measuring tiny masses. Uh, that's it. We're measuring um, the mass or the signal of a certain mass, um, and we're using that to either identify compounds or to quantify compounds. So to say what it is and to say how much. Those are the two questions you answer with mass spectrometry here. So in our case, this is our P-phosphorus. It's the rhinoceros PFOS. Um, we are needing to determine its weight, so I've got it on a little scale here. Um, and it's, it's a little defensive, says I'm not normally this heavy. I've just had too many hashtag quarantine snacks. That's okay, we're not judging. And so how would you come up with the weight of the PFOS molecule? Well, if you look at it, um, the formula C8F17SO3, um, you might start just by adding all those up. So eight carbons, um, 17 fluorines, a sulfur, and three oxygen. If you add up their atomic weights, you come up with a number of 499.1204. So is that the correct atomic mass of P phosphorus the way we'll see him in mass spectrometry? The answer is no. Um, there's a few reasons, um, but when you just add up the atomic masses, uh, you will get what we call an average mass. Um, that red X should still be here on this screen. It's, well, it, it, it does mean something. So it means instead of saying, this is what you'll measure, it's kind of like, this is the average of all the things you'll measure. Um, and yeah, P phosphorus being sassy again, told you the scale was wrong, hashtag so over it. Um, uh, so there are different isotopes that would naturally exist for P phosphorus. Um, and that's, that, that's kind of the key here is that it's not just one isotope, it's the average of a few different ones. And so how do you actually measure the mass of P phosphorus? Well, you do it by adding up the atomic exact masses. Um, so what is an exact mass? An exact mass, I've shown a few of them in the table here, is really the mass of each individual isotope, not the mass of the average of all the isotopes. You can see for carbon, we have carbon 12 and carbon 13, and those two have different masses. You can also see the relative abundance, 98.91 and 1.09, those are percent abundances. So that means that in nature, just if you go out in nature and take some carbon, 98.9% um, .9 of what you pick up will be carbon-12 and a small bit will be heavier carbon, it'll be carbon-13. It'll weigh just a little more. This is actually what you'll see in a mass spectrometer, is you'll see each exact mass individually rather than the average of all of them. Okay, so back to PFOS. When we do this, when we use that chart that I just showed and add up uh, the mass of our PFOSphorus, what we come up with now is 498.9302, not 499.1 or 2 or whatever it was, 498.9302. And we've also added in the mass of an electron here because PFOS is negatively charged. It has that, have that minus up in the rhinoceros horn. Um, and so that minus is the mass of an electron. It's a very small mass, but it matters, especially when we're going to this decimal point. Um, so now this is what PFOS is. 
but it's it's still not the whole story of the mass of PFAS. Um, so when we look at this uh, this table, we did see that there were some um, carbon 12, some carbon 13. We saw sulfur down at the bottom, 32, 33, 34, all have different masses. And if you look at sulfur 34 at the bottom, 4% uh, is its uh, relative abundance of that um, plus two, so it's 34 isotope. Um, so if, you, if you're if you familiar with this at all, you can kind of see where I'm going. If you've never heard of this before, um, what it means is figuring out how P phosphorus exists in nature is a math problem. And to demonstrate that, um, I, I threw up what theoretically 100 P phosphorus is. Is it P phosphori? I don't think so. I think it's P phosphorus. Um, I threw up what 100 P phosphorus would look like. So if you had 100, um, 100 molecules there, uh, 87 would exist as what we call the monoisotopic form. So this is the CaF17SO3. Um, that is what we would think of, but what you got to consider is eight of those hundred would exist as this, we would call this the C13 isotope. So one of those eight carbons is replaced with a heavy carbon. Just by, just by luck, um, that happens on eight of these hundred molecules. Uh, kind of interesting math-wise. One of those 100 molecules would have the um, S33 replacing our S32. And then finally, uh, we would have four S34s replace, uh, four molecules, and it looks like I've got the number of uh, rhinos wrong there, but just pretend there's four. That's okay. I don't want to do this take again, so we're just going to leave it the way it is. Um, but if four of them were the S34 version of it. Um, so that kind of like, that kind of shows you how these things exist in nature and what these natural abundances of isotopes would be. Um, so when we look at the masses, uh, first of all, the, the S33 PFOS, this is the green P-phosphorus. Um, this one came out at 499.9296. Um, the blue P phosphorus, which I called the um, babe, the big blue P fox, um, 499.9336, and then the plus two at 500.9260. And at this point, it's bored, kind of like you are saying, what's the point of all this? Showing us the different forms. Um, the point of all this is to show you in a mass spectrometer what does P fos look like, and this is what it looks like. Um, that none of our mass spectrometer software that I know of um, actually has rhinoceroses in it. Uh, so you would ignore that part. But the little bars show the relative in intensity of each isotope. So you can see the major isotope there is our monoisotope, our, our gray P phosphorus, uh, 498.9302. And really, really close together around 499.933. So those are average, um, but you see our blue and our green P phosphoruses, and then at the plus two mass, 500.9260, um, that's our, our burnt orange guy. Um, so this is important because knowing how these different peaks are derived um, shows you our PFOS fingerprint here. This is um, how PFOS looks, and this is how you identify PFOS. Um, and it, even to the point where if we now have an unknown at a different mass, but we see this um, certain characteristic ratio of the plus one to the plus two at different masses, that can help us determine, you know, back calculate what the formula is. So this is just a little introduction into PFOS mass spectrometry. Um, hopefully this, this makes sense to you. It helps you understand a little better better um, why there's more than one mass, like why more than one mass shows up. It's all about probability. It's all about, you know, a certain percentage having a certain um, separate mass. Um, so the primer for next episode, why the PFOS got together and they're confused. Why do all their masses end in 0.9? So let's go back real quick. 499.9, 498.9, 500.9. Um, if you're familiar at all, you'll see out in the world that most things don't have a decimal point of 0.9. Most things have 0 0.0, 0 0.1, 0 0.2. So PFOSers is confused and they want to know why. So that's it for today's episode. Um, Please stay tuned for tomorrow's episode, or actually uh, just part two. I think I'm gonna go ahead and film it right now, but I'm splitting it into two parts, so it's not too long. Um, and then as always, be sure to like and if, comment if you have uh, any questions or if you wanna know more about this kind of like PFAS chemistry and PFAS chemistry. And thanks for listening, bye-bye.